Um, here is Van Horn's wonderful book on the history of the Army of the Cumberland, mm -hmm. written at the behest of George Thomas. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a bit about the relationship between Thomas and Van Horn, and uh, did this do what they wanted it to do, vindication, and why did there need to be vindication for Thomas? Well, you're getting into, again, a, a series of questions that's hard to answer without combining them in some ways for what we're trying to do in a time fashion. Uh, Thomas had a tremendous relationship with most of his staff. I, I guess you can always say that there's the rare exception. I don't think off the top of my head of that rare exception for Thomas. I mean, he uniformly got along well with his staff. Uh, Chaplain Van Horn is going to be another one of those individuals that takes it upon himself to defend Thomas, uh, to promote Thomas, because of course Thomas does not do a lot of that for himself. Uh, there are other uh, subordinates that Thomas works with in various ways after the war. He writes to or that he actually enters into business with. I think there's more of an entrepreneurial side to George Thomas than people realize, especially in the post-war period. But one of the things he wanted was to make sure that the, the men that he felt gave him his reputation. He did not think he earned his reputation. He says, my, my men made me. Uh, my <laughs> army made me. And I think he was determined to get the story of that army and those men uh, into a format that he felt would, would give them their due, their just due. Understand that, again, if you're uh, under General Grant and connected to him, if you're with General Sherman and connected to him, you've got some pretty strong advocates. And uh, the people that will promote you literally within the military structure, but then the people that will promote you outside of it to the public are pretty much already there in place. Thomas is not as, as, as adept at selling uh, what he ought to have sold, which was first of all himself and then his army. And so uh, there's a lot of time where uh, I think he felt that history in its due course will do me justice. And then your last question is, did they accomplish that? I think the reason we have so many more biographies is because the feeling is that apparently that that was not accomplished, uh, that Thomas did not get his due from all of what was attempted by contemporaries, and so that people after the time have had to try to help, um, you know, redress that, uh, that gap or that grievance or whatever you'd like to describe it as. And so um, uh, Thomas, I think, would have felt that while he got the story out and Van Horn certainly, you know, emphasized the role of the Army and what it accomplished, you know, that there was more that needed to be said. So I don't think he would have minded having the, uh, someone else do that, but he wasn't going to do that for himself. Well, it, this goes into uh, also what uh, John of Ann Arbor has just uh, emailed in. Um, he says, besides saying love the bookstore and love the book signings, we thank you, John. I often hear that Thomas was probably the most underrated or underappreciated of the Union generals. My understanding was that his choice of Union loyalty cost him dearly with his family relations, given the time period, how traumatic was this for him. We just had uh, uh, a book on Henry Holt in here, and here's a border uh, southerner who stayed with the Union and um, had problems with his family during and after the war. What about Thomas? Uh, what were the relations? Uh, relations with his family during and after. Thomas had sisters that really never forgave him entirely for the choice he made. And, and they're the ones around whom the stories are built. Uh, the so-called turning the, the painting to the wall sort of stories. Uh, but in many respects, even that is not as uh, even that is not as simple as it sounds. Two brothers, one of whom lived in Vicksburg, uh, were pretty congenial to their to uh, Thomas and certainly the one that lived in Vicksburg felt that Thomas had only done what the, he had to do he, he really didn't have a choice and says as much to Francis Thomas later uh, after George has died he, he says you know I really don't think that George had a choice and that he felt he had a choice so uh, I think you get a sense where you know there seems to be that he was ostracized and cut off entirely now having said that when I go back to Southampton County to discuss George Thomas and I grew up in neighboring Nansman County so I'm a native of the county next door uh, they tell me why did you write about a, a book about that Yankee and and so there's a lot of <laughs> still sort of ruffled feathers about the choice he made even today 
But one of the greatest Virginians, a modern Virginian, a man by the name of Colgate Darden, who had been a president of the University of Virginia, governor of Georgia, uh, governor of Virginia rather, uh, he went to Southampton County in the 70s in the bicentennial year and said, it's time to recognize the contributions Thomas made. It's time for us to recognize him as, a, as an American and be proud of him as a Southampton County and, and put some of these other feelings aside. Again, and you can tell by the conversations that I've had more recently, even Colgate Darden couldn't accomplish that entirely himself. <laughs> Glenn, you uh, speak about historiography a bit in your book as well. A little well. bit. Yeah, and you have a, you say there was a convergence, convergence of many factors that produced emancipation. Right. And you have, you explain a bit the bottom-up versus the top-down historiography. Do you want to give uh, our listeners a bit of that? Well, what I was getting at is, you know, there's this debate uh, about, you know, who freed the slaves. Uh, and you have historians like McPherson, you mentioned McPherson earlier, who very dogmatically say Lincoln freed the slaves. And then, of course, you've got uh, others who argue that the slaves themselves, by you know, running the Union armies and creating this crisis of, you know, what are we going to do with all these slaves behind the lines? Are they free? Are, are they now our slaves? Are we confiscating their labor? Or are they free? Sort of forced the question onto the, you know, the Lincoln administration. Uh, I try to find a middle ground in there and say that it's a, li it's a little bit of both. And that it's more than that, right? That it's not just Lincoln, it's not just the slaves running away, it's northern public opinion, uh, which I argue is, is shaped to a large degree about what they were seeing uh, happen on the peninsula. Uh, it's Union officers uh, and soldiers themselves making you know, certain very important decisions. Even if it was just, just something as minor as uh, Union soldiers treating uh, runaway slaves well, uh, you know, and receiving them into the lines uh, and helping to stale the notion that they were evil Yankees, uh, you know, and that that helped to encourage, you know, more slaves to come, uh, again, to, to dispel this idea that their masters had planted in their heads. So it's a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what were some of those presumptions that the Northerners, the soldiery, journalists maybe even as well, and when they started to come into contact with the contrabands and with slaves trying to get away, uh, they had, must have had presumptions of what slaves and slavery was about. Sure. And how did that change, and did it change, and how did it, if, I think it did, uh, and then gradually help bring about their, the emancipation and, and make it an, an element in the North that could say, yes, we, we could fight for this as well. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, that probably goes without saying that Northerners at the time held just as many racial assumptions as did Southerners uh, about uh, African Americans and uh, their, the inherent inferiority of the race and, and so forth. And I think a lot of the soldiers and a lot of the journalists, when they came down into the South, they had those preconceived notions of just exactly what blacks were going to be. A lot of it shaped by minstrel shows, uh, you know, with... Uh, the, the Jim Crow character, uh, that, that these were, you know, uh, lighthearted people who sort of enjoyed being slaves. But what they found, you know, challenged that completely. They found that these were, uh, a lot of them were individuals who had a pretty good grasp of what the war was about. They had a pretty good grasp of what this, this war might lead to. Uh, I, you know, found many instances in which soldiers and journalists remarked on how these people are more intelligent than we thought they were going to be. They're more interesting to talk to than we thought they were going to be. They understand this war more than we thought they would. Uh, and so slowly over the time, now I'm not in any way, shape, or form trying to advocate the idea that universally Union soldiers treated African Americans behind the lines with respect and dignity because they certainly didn't. There was plenty of cruel treatment mm -hmm. to African Americans behind the lines. but. On the other hand, there were also a lot of Union soldiers who treated them with a lot of respect and a lot of dignity and whose hearts were changed uh, by what they found in the South, what they found about African Americans that challenged their preconceived notions. Uh, and you see them writing, you know, in their letters home, uh, comments in which, like you mentioned, their, their ideas about slavery are starting to change. Mm -hmm. And their ideas about uh, what this war can, can do uh, begin to change. 
So I, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of, of what you're saying here is that soldiers begin to, to have their, their hearts and their minds shaped uh, by the reality of the situation rather than what their preconceived notions were. Uh, each of you use the word retreat at some point or another in your book. <laughs> well, it's and hard not to when you're talking about McClellan. There you go. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to each of you to kind of talk about this because Thomas had his views on retreat. And uh, I think that's something I want to hear because also at the same time in your book, Glenn, the, at the end of the peninsula when the North retreated, uh, Changes base, as McClellan. Changes said. base. <laughs> and I like what uh, the reaction of a New York soldier, William Dunn, said about that, uh, who thought that retreat so fast that if put in the other direction, might have taken... <laughs> 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 right. right. So how did most soldiers view retreat, and how did Thomas view retreat? Well, you, you go ahead if you want to, since you started with McClellan. Uh, okay. <laughs> The uh, master of retreating. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was pretty good at it. You have to give him credit for that. Uh, are, are you asking about soldier responses well, did, to yeah, the retreat? Yeah, what were they, their thought when they were moving back after all the, this huge camp? Right. Well, I'm sure you know that the, historians have had a hard time trying to uh, understand, uh, knowing what we know, why the Union soldiers loved McClellan as much as they did, and they continued to love him, you know, even after he was his removed from command. What what I found is that uh, at the end of the at the end of the campaign, when it was clear that they had retreated, that the army was divided. Uh, you had a lot of soldiers who believed that, that they had been poorly led. This was especially the case among a lot of the officers uh, in the Army of the Potomac uh, that they had been poorly led. That you know that McClellan's painting this as a change of base, but clearly we're turning tail and running. On the other hand, you have a lot of soldiers who see it the way McClellan saw it, and that is that they hadn't been supported by the Lincoln administration, that Lincoln had not sent down you know, the, some 30,000 reinforcements that McClellan had been asking for since the very beginning of the Peninsula Campaign. So uh, by the end of the campaign, the, you, know, you got different opinions in the Army. You got those who you know, believe that this is McClellan's fault, and you got others who believe that this is the Lincoln administration's uh, fault. So there's, you know, Let's not simplify things, and you know, let's acknowledge that you know that that soldiers had different opinions on this. George Thomas, of course, is famous at Stones River for saying during the nighttime council of war, "This army does not retreat." And uh, of course, at Chickamauga, he's the rock of Chickamauga because he wouldn't move. <laughs> and uh, and with the uh, circumstances, wherever he was called to readjust, whatever they might be. Uh, he certainly was not one to give ground for which he had already had men fight and die if he could help it. So I think uh, with Thomas you get uh, uh, a, a sense more of, of uh, uh, not trying to look at retreat as an option if one had other options to choose, and, and he typically felt he had other options to choose. Uh, with, with Thomas, I think what you get is, that again, just that sense of solidity. You know that you can count on him. Uh, if one gets the reputation for giving ground all the time, that would, uh, that would take out an underpinning of a central element of his character. Uh, he also knew that the armies in victory are not in much better shape than armies in retreat. And it might be fine to say at Chattanooga, we'll hold the town till we starve, but, uh, but at some time you're going to have to figure out what, where you go from there. And at uh, Mill Springs, where he won his first big victory, he doesn't finish off an opponent that he might have. Uh, he's got his mind set that, that the way it'll finish is in the morning, he'll conduct a, a pretty much pro forma type of ex exercise. The Confederates will then surrender. And during the night, the Confederates slip out. It's almost like a Dunkirk moment where they slip across on the steam, steam, paddle steam wheeler um, uh, Noble Ellis, and they slip across the Cumberland River. And uh, Speed Fry, who was one of his subordinates from Lexington, Kentucky, comes up and says, General, why didn't you finish this last night? And he's had any number of reasons why that, you know, logical reasons, acceptable reasons. The weather, the length of time from the morning's engagement to an eight-mile retreat and following of a retreating army, loss of unit cohesion, loss of leadership, wounded and, and killed officers. And he has any one of those reasons, and his reason that he gives Speed Fry is, hang it, Fry, I never once thought of it. <laughs> and the reason he says that is because he was so busy setting up the next day that going ahead and finishing it just wasn't on his, on his uh, radar.